Um, so it, it's really something of that that I, I, I really enjoyed. I learned a lot from. Um, but one of the things I discovered was that there were a particular sort of pattern of grammatical mistakes that however good they were, they always made the same mistakes and they carried on making the same mistakes, however skilled they were as communicators. And these mistakes sometimes were similar to the mistake my mum and other Ukrainians I knew um, would make in talking English. And that one of the things that they did was that they just couldn't get the hang of definite and indefinite articles because they didn't exist in their own language. Um, and I started to become fascinated by the different kinds of mistakes that foreigners make in learning English, and which I suppose also a similar sort of thing happens when English people learn other languages. Um, and I didn't know any of the community languages that my students spoke, but I had studied fresh French, Russian, German. I knew about, a bit about how these languages were structured. And so, to, for example, even very educated people from a Slavic background will regularly leave out articles when they're talking English. Whereas a native German speaker might be inclined to stick extra articles in. And for example, in front of um, an abstract noun, um, you, you know, they might talk about the happiness rather than happiness. At that time, I had no inkling that all this stuff would ever be of any practical use. But in fact, one of the nice things about being a writer is that all sorts of fascinating, apparently useless experiences and knowledge can migrate into your books. So it was that when I finally was able to make a career as a writer, one of my hallmarks of my novels was the terrible English spoken by my characters. Now, some people, not you I'm sure, and no one in this room, but some people imagine that writing bad English is easy. They think you just write in normal English and then jumble, jumble it up a bit, right? No, no, no. In reality, there's Eastern European bad English, there's German bad English, there's Arabic bad English, there's French bad English. In fact, there's as many bad Englishes as there are languages whose speakers are learning English. And there's even bad, bad English, which is really a language of its own, which is sort of funny ease. You know, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's the sort of language that people think that foreigners talk because they don't understand the grammatical roots of the mistakes that people are making. And in speaking English. I get terribly irritated by other authors who think that all bad English is the same. Um, my last unpublished novel, the one that I was writing when I was in Leeds, was set in a multi-ethnic inner city community and I tried to put some of these varied characters and their varieties of English on the page. And that novel received 36 rejections before I got fed up of sending it out. Meanwhile, other writers from non-English backgrounds were beginning to break through into the literary scene. Um, from Nigeria to the Caribbean, India and Pakistan, migrants from former British colonies and refugees from the world's trouble spots were filling up English classes like the ones I taught. And um, the, there, were, there were dozens of books. It was, there was a real vogue at that time for books about India and, and TV programmes about the British in India. And then along came Salman Rushdie. And I can still remember my excitement at reading Midnight's Children in 1981, because it was so utterly different to anything I'd ever read before, not just in the way that language was used, but in the sorts of things that can be said in, in that kind of language. And the, the next book, Shame, is, is one that I particularly like. It tells, the, it tells the story of the coup in Pakistan by um, General Zia um, against Zulfiqar Zulfik Ali Bhutto. And in the passage I'm going to read, Raza Haider is um, Zia and Iskandar Harappa is, is uh, Bhutto. Haider imprisons Iskandar Iski and worse, he imposes a smoking ban. Those electrifying curses in the middle of that passage, they're expressed in an English which no Englishman could ever have written. And that was one of the amazing things about this sort of new breed of writers. They were insiders and they were outsiders. Rushdie, born in Bombay, but educated in the English public school and at Cambridge, straddled those countries so comfortably. But it was another 20 years before another insider, outsider, novelist, brought the whole story home and turned her authorial gaze on the multi-ethnic society that Britain had become. 
Zadie Smith's White Teeth, published in 2000, was the first book I read that really sum, summed up that feeling I'd grown up with, of knowing I'm an outsider and longing to fit in. And so this passage I'm going to read describes a little boy called Majid, whose parents are from Pakistan, but he just wants to be like the other kids at school who are preparing for the school harvest festival. White Teeth was quickly followed in 2004 by Andrea Levy's great bestseller, um, Small Island, which finally brought home the full circle, in full circle, the story of Britain's slave trade. But in my opinion, it's her new novel, and The Long Song, um, which is related entirely in the dialect of 19th century Jamaica that most captures the magic of language. You have to do it in the right accent, so I'm hoping I can play you a clip from the audio version read by Andrea Levy herself. Um, so, anyway, without writers like... With, without these and other great writers like that and, um, you know, Rushdie... Um, Zadie Smith, Andrea Levy, and, and also Monica Raleigh. Um, they'd obviously softened up the editors. So that by the time um, the, a short history of tractors came along, um, I, I, I doubt that without them, anyone would have given it a second look. But as it was, you know, they'd obviously softened up the editors. So when it came along, it also received um, uh, quite a warm reception. And... I was really quite inspired by um, the, these writers that have preceded me, who, who in a way took their foreignness in their stride. They didn't try to be um, English. They, they played with their, their past heritage and the English that they'd learnt to produce something completely different. And so I thought, OK, here's my chance to show off everything I've learnt about England and the English and have fun and playing around with the verbal mistakes I'd grown up with all through my childhood. And um, so the sorts of misunderstandings that are embedded not just in language, but also in culture. And um, so I'm going to read you one of my favourite scenes from A Short History of Tractors in Ukrainian. It's a tea party where Nadia, the narrator, um, first meets Valentina, um, who's the 84-year-old Papa's new wife. And some neighbours called the Zadchuks arrive with a cake. Um, so Nadia is both English and Ukrainian, but Mike, her husband, is purely English, and he hasn't a clue what's going on. Although it is October, the weather is mild and sunny. We will drink tea in the garden. Mike and Stanislav set out deck chairs and an old wonky camping table under the plum tree. Could you come, says Papa to the Zadchuks, settling back into the creaking ca canvas. Good cake. My Milochka used to make like this. Valentina takes this as a slight. In Tesco is better. <laughs> Mrs. Zarchuk is offended. I like baking cake better. Mr. Zarchuk springs to her defence. Why are you buying cake in Tesco, Valentina? Why are you no baking? Woman should bake. Valentina is still in full eruption mode from her encounter with me. I know time baking, all day working for money, buy cake, buy clothes, buy car, no good meanie husband, give no money. She, she makes a dramatic bosom lunge in my father's direction and alarmed, he looks to Mike for help. Mike, not knowing enough Ukrainian to understand what's going on, fatally returns to the subject of cake and ingratiates himself with Mrs. Zadchuk by helping himself to another large slice. Mmm, delicious. Mrs. Zadchuk's pink cheeks glow. She pats his thigh. You good eat. I like man good eat. Why you no eat more, Yuri? Mr. Zadchuk takes this as a slight. Too much cake make fatty tum. You fatty margarita, a little bit fatty. Mrs. Zadchuk takes this as a slight. Better fatty than skinny. Look, Nadezhda, she skinny Bangladesh lady. I take this as a slight. Righteously, I draw in my stomach. Thin is good, thin is healthy, thin people live longer. All of them turn on me with howls of derisive laughter. Thin is hunger, thin is famine. Everybody thin, drop over dead. Ha <laughs> ha. I like fatty, says my father. He places a placatory wizened hand on Valentina's breast and gives it a little squeeze. 
Blood rushes to my head. I jump up and accidentally catch the leg of the table, sending the teapot and the remains of the cake sliding onto the ground. The tea party has not been a success. <laughs> well, once I'd realised, once I'd wised up on the fun you could get from characters who hadn't had the benefit of professionally taught English classes, there was no stopping me. So Tractors was followed up by two caravans, which has got nine distinct voices, including a dog who took bad English to new heights. In fact, he wasn't very bright, but he had a vivid olfactory imagination. And um, the third book, We're All Made of Glue, has got characters from Yorkshire, Germany, Israel, and Palestine. And the heroine, who wants to write romantic fiction, but has to earn a living writing for an adhesive trade magazine. Inevitably, the narratives all leach into each other. And um, my new book, Various Pets Alive and Dead, plays a new kind of inter intergenerational language game. Um, it's, it's about a lot of things, but among them, it's, a, it's about a commune of left-wing hippies living in a squat near Doncaster, and their children who haven't a clue what the adults are on about. So I'm going to read you a little bit from this. And Clara, who's nine, her teacher is at school has, has um, said that she's from a single-parent family. Clara wants to know what that means, so she asks the adults while they're all having dinner. Um, and actually, here's a little picture of me in my commune. I don't know if you recognise on the side, we're all having dinner. The children aren't in this one, but there were actually children in our commune as well. And the teacher said, we're a singing parent family, so why don't you ever sing, said Clara. <laughs> Arise, ye starlings, from your slumbers. Fred the Red's deep baritone rolled from the end of the table. It's not singing parent, it's single pa parent, Clara, Nick Holliday explained in his quiet, teachery way. It's when children have just a mother or just a father. Clara felt a small prick of loss at the dullness of it. A family means whatever you want it to mean, thundered Fred, waving the ladle for attention and weighing into the discussion. Historically, it's taken a number of different forms, including... Great dinner, Moira. Marcus grabbed the ladle from Fred and helped himself to more stew, which, apart from the beans, contained only chopped onions, tinned tomatoes, and several of Moira's long auburn hairs. Shouldn't one of you feminists explain to Clara that the family is a patriarchal construct to facilitate the subordination of women and enslave them within the domestic sphere? As he spoke... A light clicked on in Clara's brain. She stirred the words around in her head like a magic potion. She committed them to memory. She practiced saying them out loud when she was own, on her own. They tasted of power. Then one day she got a chance to use them. Now, I'd like you all to write a page about your family, said the class teacher. <laughs> Clara put her hand up. Miss! The family is a patriarch construction to fascinate the sobbing nation of women in domestos fear. <laughs> Everyone stared at her in amazement. The teacher fixed her with a stony look. Those are very big words for a very little girl. Clara just smirked and lowered her eyes, letting the words work their magic. And for Clara, at that moment of the magic of the words was actually the turning point because it's the point at which she, from being the sort of um, object of bullying and ridicule in the class, she became the one who everybody looked up to and turned to for explanations. Um, as Clara found, having words and knowing how to use them for effect is extraordinarily empow empowering. And for this reason, although once again I hate to find myself on the same side as the most illiberal politicians, I do think that everyone who comes to live in a country, in any country, should learn the language. And so I wish my mother had had the opportunities that people here in this room represent. And I hope that future gener generations of immigrants or refugees like ourselves will continue to have them. And I think it's particularly ironic that the political pressure to learn English is coming just at the same time that funding for community education is coming under pressure. So let's just hope it's one stupidity that doesn't happen. Have a great conference, and thank you.